Guys, I've got a fantastic guest this week. Uh, I, Matthew B. Cox, author, uh, a, a prolific confidence man. Uh, and as we just said uh, right before the, we started recording, uh, narcissist. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> prolific narcissist, prolific com. But uh, if people don't know your work, you, you've written at this point, what, eight books? Is it seven or eight books? Yeah. Um, and they and, and like 20 synopses, like 20 short stories, kind of like almost like a script, but it's not a script. It's like a long form synopsis, like a, a, a like an article you would read in a, in a book or in a magazine. Yeah. And anybody can find those inside true crime.com is a website, right? Right. Okay. So you can find those there. And it's like you, so you wrote a lot of these stories. I want to get into the newest book, which is called It's Insanity. But you wrote a lot of these stories. You wrote, you got these stories lined up while you were in prison for mortgage fraud. Yeah. Yeah. So you could also go to, sorry, one more thing. The audio versions of all those stories are on my YouTube channel, which is Matthew Cox and Inside True Crime. Okay, cool. Yeah. No worries. Um, Nobody reads, bro. Nobody yeah, that's true. That's true. It, 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 it is. Like, a, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Can I cuss? No. No. Yeah, of course. Sorry. I mean, I'm so lazy. Like it's like, I, I, I can't read my own stuff. Like it's, it's like, I, I, I it's, I'll listen. <laughs> some of them will listen to two and three times because somebody else is reading it. Okay. I mean, it's just, and I, I, nobody reads. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it is kind of true. I listened to the audio book of it's insanity yesterday, but I did read, uh, I read the synopsis that you put together because you, uh, wrote a memoir that uh, is the same story as War Dogs. Right. I wrote I wrote the Ephraim Dev Rowley is the guy that Jonah Hill plays in the movie. War mm-hmm. Dogs. I read I wrote his memoir while I was in prison with him and it was published. It's called Once a Gun Runner, which is mm-hmm. the real story. It's not War Dogs. War Dogs is like 80 percent fiction. Like they never there's just all these things. They never went to Iraq. They never got shot at. They never did. There's none of this stuff. Sat. Like, like, it's like this completely, they just went completely off the grid. It's like, basically that movie consists. The only true part is, Hey, guess what? There were two stoner, stoner kids that were selling arms to the U S government for the Iraqi uh, security forces and the, um, um, and the Afghani security forces. Other than that, it's complete fiction. <laughs> Well, which is which is ridiculous because that's an interesting story, right? Well, the, if you if you read the like the book is amazing. Like you, mm-hmm. what this guy did is so over the top compared to the way they portray him in the movie. Oh, what, what do you mean? Like what? I actually haven't gotten a chance to check that book out yet. So what do you? So what do you mean? What is the difference? Like in all honesty, like what he pulled off. Um, I mean, just getting those contracts, like, like everybody's like, oh, wow, he stumbled into getting like a $300 million contract. Well, wait a second. He had a $51 million contract before that. Mm. that was completely complete. He had multiple two and $3 million contracts, $10 million contracts. So he'd been doing this for, it wasn't that long. It was a few, it was since he was 17 years old. So wow. Since 17, he'd been doing this. He was worth millions of dollars before Pacows even came along. That's crazy. I didn't, I didn't even realize he had been doing that. that. So you know he, he did, you know, it's mm. funny. This is the, he, did you ever see the movie, the Lord of war? Yeah. I actually have a weird problem with that movie is that I'm a Brooklyn guy and uh, no one has a Russian accent and it infuriates me. Okay. Well, he, so basically remember how he keeps going over to uh, um, the, uh, the old Soviet bloc countries, um, hmm. you know, uh, um, you know, uh, whatever, uh, uh Albania and Chechnya and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, so that's what that's what Devaroli was doing. He's going over there negotiating with these these former Soviet Union uh, countries, and he's negotiating with them to buy up their armaments. That's what he's. So it's more of a Lord of War uh, mm. story than it is this stoner version story where they're in a, they're in Iraq they're be, they're driving you know shipments in it none of that happened but it is a very much a lore of war story mm. but i mean yeah, which, which again is an interesting because the idea was they were just buying these arms that these guys had and then selling it to the u.s to give to iraqi forces right it, right right uh, afghani the, the 300 million dollar contract was for the afghan security forces mm-hmm. with 
um, which was all uh, munitions, by the way. But the $51 million contract he had was for like AK-47s and stuff for the Afghani security forces. Mm. Uh, Afghani, I'm sorry, for the Iraqi security forces. So he both wars, he's supporting our allies on both sides of the war. Okay. But he never went to, he never went to Iraq. He never went to Afghanistan. That's funny. So he was just doing that all. He was just going to the Eastern Bloc countries, taking their arms and selling it to the U.S. government, who was then shipping it back to Iraq and Afghanistan. Right. And he has super amazing stories about that. It's like, why not go with that? Yeah, especially because uh, Eastern Europeans are terrifying. Like, they're just as scary as Arab guys. I, I Listen, I love you. Know, anyway, you'd have to talk to Deverell. He's hilarious about yeah. the, the Eastern European women. And this. he's like, oh, God, they're vicious, bro. They're vicious. Just, you know, as far as like, it's all about money. Like everything mm. is a transaction. Everything's transactional, which of course he loves. Yeah. I mean, well, like, look, once you're in that, once you're at that point, you got to love that. I mean, once you're, once you're making, when you have a $51 million contract with the US government, you're going to enjoy right. the transactional nature of that. But so you met a lot of these guys. It, you were in, you were the Secret Service's number one most wanted criminal at a point. And yeah. that's, so you ended up in prison with, the guys who did the most insane things. And this is why I want to talk about, uh, you, you, you have this great book about Frank Amadeo, who it's called in, it's insanity. And anybody should go check this out because it is the most absolutely batshit story. I, it, it reads like a comic book. Yeah. It's, 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 he's, he's, he's crazy. I mean, cr- crazy, brilliant in a, you know, in a James Bond specter kind of way. Well, he got years off. He was getting years off tons of prisoner sentences. And the reason why you started to believe him is because he got so much time off your sentence, correct? Yeah, that, that's definitely definitely one of the things is that, you know, like you had said, like, do you believe all the stuff? Well, first of all, I, I had access to all of his um, his discovery. So I've read all of the, tran- uh, the transcripts of his sentencing and mm-hmm. then the hearings and all these other things uh, of his competency uh, hearings. And so it's like, do you believe that he was meeting with President Bush? Well, even if I didn't have the photos, yeah. when you hear the judge talking about it, you're like, well, the judge is talking about how he used to meet with President Bush. And the judge is talking about how he, you know, the judge and the U.S. attorney are talking about how they're, um, uh, how he, he, tr- he plotted to take over the Congo. Um, there's newspaper articles about his, the, the attempted coup and, uh, Tajikistan or something. I mean, it's just, it's just insane. Like you, you're like that. He's trying to buy airplane, trying to buy like used F-15s and F-16s. You're going, how is this possible? Like I can't, the things that are so insane that you're like, I can't believe this, I can prove. But the minor things, little things that you're like, does that seem plausible? And he's you know? in jail, not for any of, th- he's in jail for financial crimes. He's in jail because he stole, because he stole nearly $200 million from the federal government and was using it to fund the purchase of, of used F-15s and F-16s and to fund a military that was trying to basically take over parts of Africa. So, I mean, for just a backstory for listeners is this guy, Frank Amadeo, he started off as a lawyer. He gets disbarred. He starts, um, he basically was like, when you hear of like a corporate chop shop, right? He would acquire right. companies and break them down. And he was making millions and millions of dollars doing this and then leveraging the debt they had against the IRS, saying that he paid them back in like stock and different ways so that he had hundreds of millions of dollars in debt and he was defrauding them hundreds of millions of dollars, everything like you said. But it was all because he somehow believed that he can use a, he could do a corporate takeover of the planet earth. Like he firmly believed that he would be emperor of the entire planet. Right. Yeah. As insane as that sounds like that's probably a a very succinct version um, or or explanation, explanation of what he was doing. For for instance, so he's a lawyer, but Mm -hmm. since he was in his teenage years, he has been, hearing the voice of God telling him he is preordained to be emperor of the world, which I love. Who says emperor of the world? Not ruler, but he's emperor of the world. And and yet he went on to get, and he's been talking about it since he was a kid. Like I, I've read the reports, the psychiatrist reports, which talk about how, um, how his family members and stuff have said 
that, oh, no, no, he's been, he's been talking about this since he was a teenager or, or in, since he's 13, 14 years old. He's been talking mm-hmm. about how he's going to take over the world. Then he ends up graduating high school, college, gets his law degree, and then become, starts, becomes a, um, a lawyer, which his specialty was tax law. And then he starts taking companies that are failing and he's either breaking them apart and selling, uh, selling them off, or he's buying them and then negotiating with their creditors to make them a viable productive company again. And of course, most of a lot of these companies, what he would do is he would withhold the payroll taxes that go to the IRS. Mm. And then he'd use, just like you said, he'd use that money to leverage his, the debt, the, the owed debt to the IRS and say, look, we'll pay you this much of the money we owe you at, on a payment plan. And then he'd take that money and use that money to buy other companies or fix the company he's currently with to make it make it profitable. And as a result, he ended up owning something like 80 companies or something. And this is a guy who was so, he was so good at it. I mean, there's a passage in the book where you're talking about he had a merger meeting and he's wearing a Darth Vader helmet doing the breathing this the whole good. time. And nobody said anything because they knew he was good at his job. Well, I think this because they knew he was just insane, bro. I mean, these are people <laughs> like if you're if you're my accountant, I'm paying you 300,000 a year, 200,000 a year. And I've got I'm paying everybody these astronomical um, salaries. And, and I walk in and sit down and start conducting a meeting. And they also know he's explosive, like he'll explode into rages and mm. yell scream and fire people and then hire him back two days later and so you know he's he's you don't know what he's going to do so he walks in in this Darth Vader helmet in one scene in that book sits down and conducts the entire meeting nobody says shit but here's the thing so I had heard about that while I was in prison and I heard it through the grapevine that he had done that and then I so and I remember that's one of those little things that I was like come on bro that's insane that didn't happen but I, then I'm reading his transcripts and one of the people gets on the stand that used to work for him and she explains how, he, yeah, I mean, he's crazy. At one point, he actually came in with a Darth Vader mask. He used to wear it, as she said, he used to wear it around the, uh, around the office. But wasn't this, this is the same woman who, uh, she was the one who almost sunk him, right? Because of, she wouldn't admit he was, she worked for a crazy person. Right, right, exactly. Remember, I, I interviewed that CIA guy. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, what, what are these people going to do? They're going to say, I knowingly work for someone who's walking around talking about how he's going to ultimately take over the world. They can't do that. They're, they're going to be like, I had never heard anything about that. I never heard him say that. Some other people said it. I mean, you you saw the, you read you know, the book. I mean, I got multiple interviews with people that were like, yeah, he did. He talked about it all the time. You know, you got other people, you got one other guy that's going, nah, listen, it was so bad. His his bipolar disorder was so radical or so, you know, so sporadic up and down that they actually hired a full-time psychiatrist to be on staff and gave him an office to be there just to keep an eye on him. Just in case he went off. Just to, yeah, try and talk and, him down. And he's making enough money for everybody. And like, this is a guy who orchestrated essentially two coups, right? Like, like actual coups. Oh yeah, definitely the one in the Congo. There's a, there's a, on my channel, there's a, um, a documentary about it. It's called Nine Days in the Congo. And, you know, like 32 guys got arrested. He, you know, uh, the guy running his security force was a uh, ex, was he, uh, his name's Kevin Billings. He's ex um, Secret Service. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus they had a, another guy, they, they had all these security experts, but like 32 of his guys got held, they got grabbed and held for nine days and they eventually convinced them to let him go. And, you know, so it's, it's, Super and Frank's arrest. on house arrest now. He's on house arrest. He's not even still locked up, correct? Yeah, he's he got himself released on house arrest. Nine years house arrest. So it did like nine years. Now he's on nine years house arrest. And um, yeah, that's it. That's, I mean, it's crazy. So he can't, obviously you can't, you say at the end of the book, you'd like to talk to him, but you can't because you're not allowed to talk to convicted felons. Yeah, I would, what I would, I probably could do is... I could probably, um, I'm sure if I talk to my, that's going to be a deny. Um, uh, I, I'm sure if I contacted my probation officer and ex- explained the whole situation and said, look, you know, this is what's going on. I need to talk to him. I wrote a book about the guy. She'd let me, but you know, I, there's no real reason other than, uh, there's no real reason for me to talk to him. Like if, other than to say what, Hey, what's going on? How are you doing? There's just no reason to. So mm-hmm. I ask for very little from probation because you don't want to be the guy that's constantly calling to ask because pretty soon they just start denying every request you make. 
I see. Well, that makes sense. I mean, look, as as a podcaster, I mean, you tell me I I don't know what the benefit of talking to this guy is, and I'm just like, this is it's you got to have you got five hours of content. I'm yeah, sure he'd just yeah. go off. Oh, he, oh, he's 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 amazing. He's amazing. You are. Yeah. Awesome. All right. I'll, well, I'll probably ask you for his contact info. I'll, I'll shoot him a text. Um, but I want to get into actually the way you you got jammed up. You were a mortgage broker, right? Mm-hmm. And then yeah. you. So this is around you. It was you built them out of how much? Fifteen million dollars over the course of time. Over the course yeah, of I mean, a few they- years. Like the mortgage, it depends on if you include the mortgage company stuff, which they didn't. Uh, they didn't include. There's like forty million in in fraudulent mortgages in the mortgage company. But then I personally, they talked them down to about fifteen million that I personally mm. was responsible for, and there's six million dollars uh, that I still owe. And just to be clear, this is you just robbed banks essentially. Yeah, it was just bank fraud. It was bank fraud. Yeah, so you did, you committed, but the way you did it was you were a broker and you would just kind of fudge papers, realized it was easy, and then you started taking out. Then I started, uh, started making synthetic identities. I started creating people that didn't exist, mm-hmm. and I started a scheme where I raised the value in an area outside Tampa called Ybor City. I raised the the property value from a hundred thousand to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and I bought uh, the the. The FBI said 109 houses. I don't think it was that much, but they exaggerate. But Mm. so what I did was I started buying houses in the names of fake people, synthetic identities, and Mm -hmm. then I would finance the house. So I buy a house for 40,000, record the value at 200. Then I go to the bank and have them lend this guy money on this house for $180,000, let's say. And so I bought it for 40. I put 10 in it to clean it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I pull out a hundred and what, 130,000, 100 and, 130, 120,000 after some closing costs and all the other fees. So basically make around a hundred, 120,000 per, you know, per loan or per house. And I did roughly five or six houses in each person's name. So it was roughly each guy was worth about a million dollars. But this was at a time when like, so this is during the subprime mortgage, like it was building to the subprime mortgage crisis, yes. correct? Yes. Well, it's an interesting thing because you were building the fake identities. I want to talk about the subprime thing in a second, but a lot of people don't realize, I, I don't know if it still is this easy, but I knew a guy that he said he stopped doing this after 9-11 because it felt, it, it was nerve wracking to him to do it after that. But his entire job was he would find the social security number. He would go to a hall of records in like a small town where there was a stillbirth, get a social security guard for a stillbirth child who was like, who was born, issued a social security number, birth certificate, and then passed away within a day or so. And he would build an identity around that and just max out credit cards. That was his entire job. Um, because this was also when you could get a credit card for nothing. So it was like probably a lower level version of what you were doing. But I think people don't realize like it was, it's just, it was very easy to do that at a point. Is it still, do you think it's still that easy? No, yeah, it's, it's still easy. Still to easy. build a complete fake identity? Absolutely. Uh, they, they, a lot of guys do it now. They call them like a CPNs and they'll, mm-hmm. they'll say, Oh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing CPNs and they'll try and tell you it's legal and you know, it's illegal. I mean, you're telling you're, you're applying for loans and credit cards in the name of people that don't exist. And it's so- still, they, they've never closed the loophole. Like I know you've done a lot of work with, to get time off your sentence with some of these mortgage guys to kind of identify this and it just hasn't helped. Right. Well, no, I mean, you have to think that the credit, okay, so you would have to get social security, social security right now, like quarterly, they, they let the credit bureaus know, Hey, here's, here is a batch of social security numbers that were issued, Mm -hmm. but they don't tell them any particulars. They don't tell them a date of birth or a name or anything like that. So all they know is, okay, these were issued within the last year. These Mm -hmm. were issued in the last, these were issued. So if I go in, I take one of those credit, those, 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 um, social security numbers, which of course are primarily issued to children. So mm-hmm. then like, I, and that's what I did. Like I would make, I would go to social security and I'd get them to issue me a social security number for a 10 month old child that doesn't even exist. Then I'd apply for credit cards. Well, the credit bureaus don't have any idea what the date of birth is. Mm. So I'm saying, Hey, this is my name. Here's my date of birth. And here's my, here's my, uh, here's my social. Well, if nobody else is using that, then they have no conflicting information on that social security number. So they create a credit for profile saying, hey, this guy was born July 7th, 1970. Mm-hmm. And this is his SOCH. 
and this is his date of birth. And this, I mean, this is his, yeah, I'm sorry, this is his address. And this is his name. All they know is that social security number was issued. They don't know who to who. They don't know what their date of birth is. So they, it could be anybody. It could be a, an immigrant comes over mm -hmm. and becomes a citizen. It could be somebody gets their social security number changed. Names change all the time. People get name changes. People get married. There's all kinds of reasons. So that's, there's like, ah, it's too much hassle to even use all that information. Mm. It, it's, a, it's a little tiny loop, loophole that allows you to kind of get your way in there, create your own credit profile, provided nobody's using that SOCH, and then apply for a bunch of secured credit cards. You get the secured credit cards. And six months later, you've got credit scores. Now I can get regular credit. Yeah, because all you need for a secured credit card is $500, right? Right, right. Some you just go to Capital cheaper. One or whatever. Yeah, some places do them cheaper. Hmm. No, that's, I mean, I, I know that's the first place I had to get a credit card was Capital One. And it really, they didn't ask anything. They were just like, this is your name. And then here's 500 bucks. And then they'll just give you whatever, a thousand dollar credit limit or whatever. Yeah. You, typically what you, typically it's what you put up. Look, it, I got to the, I got to the, uh, cre to the um, halfway house with no credit. Like mm -hmm. I hadn't used my credit in over 15 years. Mm -hmm. you pulled my credit, nothing. And well, I, obviously, because you're in prison. I'd been in prison. I'd been on the run for three years and I was in prison for, for 12 and a half years. So mm -hmm. when I pulled my credit, boom, I got nothing. So I turned around, I got three secure credit cards. I made the payments. By the time I walked out of the halfway house, I had 750 credit scores. That's great. Um, so yeah, so what I wanted to ask you about was the, uh, so yeah, so you're doing this during uh, the buildup to what became known as the mortgage crisis, the great recession or whatever. Was it easier then or could you like, could this happen again? Could somebody do what you did again? No problem. Yeah. It's, it's so, easier now than it was then. So say, go ahead. So they closed, no, they closed nothing after all that, uh, that whole shit show. But I mean, you know, they didn't close anything like as a result of me because I didn't cost them anything. I cost a bunch mm -hmm. of banks some money. So what, you know, nobody cares. The banks aren't, the banks are like, what are we going to do? We're going to spend tens of millions of dollars to try and fix some, some loophole that doesn't really affect us. They've already built in fraud. The actuaries already assume there's going to be a certain amount of fraud and they've included it when they calculate your interest rate. Mm. So they already know there's a certain amount of fraud. It doesn't cost the government anything. Government didn't call, cost them anything. So like, like you could try and close, try and fix public records, but why would you fix, who would fix public records? Why would the government spend millions of dollars, shoot hundreds of millions of dollars to try and fix public records throughout the entire United States when it didn't cost them a dime. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and nobody, it's really an un, it's an unsellable thing because like they, I, whatever, I read some articles about you and they would try to paint you as this, uh, this bad per because they would use like, Oh, he even used the credit, the social security number of a toddler and this and that. But it's like, if you actually have any reading comprehension, you just go, this guy's just robbing banks. Who gives right. a shit? Like if you're just like, if you're a guy like me or just a guy on the street, you go, yeah, fuck the banks. So it's not a sexy, it's not a sexy policy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I always love that, the, the, the toddler thing. Okay. I went to, I would manufacture a false birth certificate. Mm -hmm. I would manufacture a false shot record. I would mm -hmm. go into the social security office and I would say, Hey, my, my 10 month old daughter was born without at home with a midwife. Here's my, her shot record. Here's her birth certificate. Can you get me a social security card issued? And they would say, yes, we can. They would play with the computer for a little bit, come back and say, you'll have it in 10 days. And 10 days later, I would have a, a social security card with my daughter's social security number on it. Then I'd register, then, I, then I'd, um, I'd go ahead and, and apply for all the credit cards. So it's like when they would say- oh, So it wasn't even a real toddler. If you were driving a Honda instead of an Audi, you'd basically be fucking Robin Hood. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, if I guess, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. But uh, I just, this is a weird thing. So you're in the mortgage industry. Now you have people coming in and you guys were just, at the time, it was easy to get a, it was easier to get a mortgage than it is now. Somebody's trying to get a mortgage right now. And like, I'm just curious, and this is something I talked to you about when we talked on the phone, is at the time, everybody, I remember a 20-year-old mortgage broker, I'm 21, telling me, I can get you a mortgage. I'm like, I'm selling weed in a one-bedroom apartment that I live in with my dad. You can get me a mortgage on a building. And he was like, yep, no problem. And this is how I feel about people trying to make money in crypto and the market today. Like, yeah. is there, is it the same level of like, in, when you see it's it, you, like, like, there's no reason to lend this person that money. 
Yeah. I mean, how does this work? Like their fraud has to be involved. Just- yeah, that's what I figured at the time. Well, I remember they were telling me they were like, they go to me, they go, well, yeah, it's a, it's an adjustable rate mortgage. I was like, well, what does it adjust to? They were like, we don't know. And I was like, yeah, no, I can't, I can't just take this loan out. <laughs> but I think that's like people doing, people are doing that with margin calls on Robinhood. They don't know that they're going to get, they can get fucked on that. Right. Yeah. You, yeah. you, you just, you just see it as another, uh, this is like as somebody who's observe this, watched it happen. Do you kind of see this like retail investment bubble as a similar bubble to the mortgage bubble at the time? Oh, it's yeah. I, I, I everybody's like, what do you think is going to happen in the market? I'm like, you can't, you can't have a half the country out of work, continue to give them money, have the real estate market prices shooting through the roof and continue to give them, loan them money and think that, that it's not going to be an issue at some point. I mean, oh, you know, you're saying that it, it's even affecting the housing. Well, I've actually noticed yeah, the cost of rental properties is going through the roof. It's insane down here. Houses that were selling for 100,000 are selling for 190, 200, 230. People, I, got, I know realtors that are saying, literally, I'll put a house on the market and get five, uh, five, five contracts on the house above what we're asking for it. Oh, because you're in Florida, right? Yeah. So in Florida, I mean, obviously, everybody who doesn't want to deal with whatever just happened as like, I was just down in uh, Tampa a couple yeah, of months ago. That's where I'm in Tampa. Yeah. I was just, I was just down there and you could see, and like, I talked to some people about the real estate down there and they were just like, it's insane. Like it it's, it's anything by the water because everybody who's scared that this is going to happen again, but doesn't, isn't scared of COVID just is scared of the repercussions on finance is just yeah. moving to Florida, just flooding into Florida and Texas, but even more so Florida because they're even saying they don't want COVID passports. DeSantis is playing ball with everybody. What do you mean COVID passports? Oh, do you not, do you not know about this? Oh, that they're saying you have to get a, a, a test to what? What's a, what's a COVID passport? So they're trying to create a digital passport where you have to, like a vaccine passport. So it's an, it would be an app run by some tech company that the government would have your record that you got a vaccine, your name and connect everything. It's just a, it's a national registry, which is unconstitutional. And Rob DeSantis was like, you'll never need one of those to come to Florida. He just got to, <laughs> like, it's not even a thing yet. And Rob DeSantis already like wrote in a law Sorry, people to come it, to God. Florida. We're yeah. We're, yeah. We're just yeah. no masks, whatever. Listen, like, I went to, um, <clears throat> oh, where did you say, where are you? I'm in Brooklyn. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So, um, so I, have you been to California lately? No, I haven't been to California. And I know I talked to my buddy in San Francisco and he's just like, it is not good. No, it, it's listen, the homeless population in LA and San Francisco, because I've been both of to both those places last year, it's it's insane. I mean, I've never seen any and this was well, one of them was prior to COVID. So mm-hmm. San Francisco was prior to COVID yeah. and LA was after COVID. And it was just they're everywhere. They're everywhere. They're shitting on the fucking sidewalk. They're pissing in the street. They're, they've got, they give them little tents. They're, 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 you're walking down the street and there's like six of them with little tents or there's 300 of them over in this area. Or there's a thousand of them here. They're, they're, they're walking up, they're robbing places. They're, they, they basically, a guy told me basically, unless they steal over 500 bucks, they don't prosecute them. They'll arrest them, take them downtown, take their picture and release them. Mm. And so basically there's tons of businesses that have just been run out because the homeless will walk in. The only big, only major chains are even still around in, in LA because they can sustain, they can hire, they can afford to hire a, a security guard. Mm. Mom and pop places are just completely run out. And, and, and it's ridiculous. But what I was saying is somebody was like, you know, well, what's it like in Tampa? I said, in, in Tampa? I said, you drive through Tampa and you barely see any homeless. You're yeah, it's true. It's beautiful. This You might see, you might drive around Tampa and see 20 or 30 guys compared to seeing 2000 guys. And, uh, and I, I sat there and they were like, they go, really? I said, listen, you don't understand how many hunters there are. Do you understand? I said, they was well, it. Florida's like, a, 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 it, there's a ton of like hardcore conservative hunters. They would convince the governor, to let them tag these guys and have hunting season down here. So they would never put up with it. Well, it's like all those guys who live in boats by the VA down there. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever seen that? I know guys that I know I got a buddy who's lived on boats for years and, and, and the cops will come and try and get rid of him and try and move him and try and, and he fights with them and argues and moves the boat here. I mean, they're trying to, it's like, I'm not breaking the law. 
doesn't matter. We don't want you here. Oh, they'll still do that to those guys. I know. Cause I just know I, I saw a bunch of the, like the small boats where it's like essentially homeless guys just live on these boats so they could be near the VA. Yeah. Well, and they'll, they'll hassle them, you know, so they, they'll hassle them constantly. It just depends on, on how determined they are to stay in that area. Look, the cops mm-hmm. will basically chase away homeless people. Like there's, there's very, very little support for homeless people here. There's tons in LA. Mm. I mean, I would, but you'd imagine the weather would just obviously I live outside 20 all year round. Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing is like, did you ever see those videos? Why all these people are leaving LA? Yeah. I mean, I, I've, I've heard of a lot of the reasons just like that people just don't trust the government of California anymore. Well, and, and your chart, so your chart, so you're, I'm living in a $3 million condo. I'm getting charged. I'm getting hit on my federal income tax, 20, 30%. And then the California is coming in and hit me for another 10 or 15%. And then I've got homeless people taking a shit outside my house and you call the cops and they can't do anything. And, and so you're giving away my money. You're giving, you're providing all these, you're bringing them in. Yeah. And you're asking me to pay 50% of everything I make over to you so that you can create an environment where I can't walk my child down the sidewalk because people are shooting up. Well, I mean, even beyond that, my buddy, I mean, he's talking about years ago, the same guy I was talking about at San Francisco. I remember him telling me, he goes, he goes, it's so expensive and so ridiculous here that I'm bussing my own tables. He's like, it's literally the homeless and the wealthy. Cause he's yeah. like a, you know, he's a tech guy. So he's just like, he's like, he's like, these people have priced themselves out. They can't build up. So housing is so expensive. He's like, no waiters can afford to live there. He's like, I'm bussing my own table when I paid $80 for dinner. Yeah. I, I know a guy that was lived, lived in his car for like a month and a half. Probably doing well. It's, it, it, it is an insane, it's an insane thing that's happening out and there. He had a job. By the way, had a full-time job. You have a full-time job, you know, but you can't afford to live there. So you're making like $22 an hour and you're in between places and you basically have to live in your car for a month and a half just to save up enough to get into another place. That basically is just a tiny little efficiency shithole. Yeah, and yeah. If, if you make 20, listen, you make 22 bucks an hour here, Oh yeah, that's so a nice one bedroom. Have a car. You get in. You have insurance. I mean, you can afford almost everything. It's ridiculous. Well, that's what a lot of people don't realize is like you see the the uh, the minimum wage debate comes up over and over and over again. And I'm like, in upstate New York, for fifteen dollars an hour, you you're fine. Yeah. Like you know what I mean? Like 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 because I'll talk to people that I live around, and they're like, who can live on fifteen dollars an hour? I'm like, go to Western New York. You can rent an apartment. You can have a car. You can have a two bedroom apartment for you know four hundred bucks a month. Yeah. Yeah. That, well, I don't know why here you're not going to get that, but yeah, but, but still the, the point is, is, is that you really, honestly, I mean, you should be, I understand you're making minimum wage that sucks yeah. and you're not going to live well, but you should be able to afford to be able to live on minimum wage. That's so true. Whatever that, you know what I'm saying? It's like, okay, this is the minimum. Now I'm not saying you get all these perks. You don't, maybe you don't necessarily get to drive a brand new car and have all this, uh, you know, special stuff, but you should be able to, feed yourself and pay your your rent and electric and have enough to get transportation back for the work I mean, that should be that seems just reasonable no yeah no I, I i completely agree it's just sometimes you might just have to move you know what i mean there's nothing wrong with a 16 year old making 15 dollars an hour in new york city either yeah you're yeah. living at home with your parents yeah all right that's fine like i i, I always paid when i run businesses i always paid more than the minimum wage because you should but I'm just saying it's like whenever it comes up, it's like, I don't think, I think people get into this mindset of just where they are and they don't realize other, like you said, $22 an hour in Tampa is not $22 an hour in New York city. It's oh, not no. $22 yeah, an hour for in- LA. Yeah. 22 bucks an hour in LA. You're still, you're still, you're living in your car yeah. or you're renting a room. It's, it's just amazing. The fluctuation. Yeah. Well, well, to get back onto You're just some of this, topic. yeah, to get back, back onto some of this stuff, I got to actually ask you, so you, you're locked up and you start accumulating these stories. At what point do you want to start writing them down? And do you know, cause like, um, even in, like in your books, you even talk about like the plan was always, you start the website and you kind of sell rights to these stories and then licensing them out for film and stuff. But like, where did you come up with that from where you started? Like what made you want to go into that field? Well, 
Well, one, because the, the, I, I knew I had to figure out how to do something, you know, when I got out, because the, the judge was very clear that I couldn't commit bank fraud anymore. He was very clear on that subject. Um, so, you know, so fraud's not an issue or fraud's not an option anymore. So mm -hmm. I got to do something. And of course, what kind of a con man would I be if I didn't see the opportunity in, in being surrounded by guys with great stories, you know, and what can I do with these stories? Well, so once I wrote my memoir and then I wrote Devaroli's story, and then I started writing other guys stories like guys are coming up to me. Saying, you got to write my story. You got to write my story. And I was like, yeah, you don't really have a story. Like you have a good story, but you have no publicity. You know, mm. Cause they're all like, you wrote Deb Rowley's story. Yeah. But he had a ton of publicity. He had a very unique story. And you've got an okay story, but you have no publicity. Mm. And, and, and so what happened was there was a guy named Doug Dodd. And I went, you know, if I could get you into like Rolling Stone or GQ or something like a true crime article about you, well, you think you could do that? And I was like, let me, you know, I'm not going to write your book. I'm going to write a synopsis. I'll write a small, like a, an article and I'll send it out and see what happens. Mm -hmm. so I, did. I sent it out and I got a bunch of reporters that came back and said, absolutely. I'm interested. One guy said, I can do it right away. Cause it's down to him and like three other guys. He was the guy that said, I could do it right away. Okay. I said, okay. So then he basically took my art, my story, rewrote it a little bit, mm -hmm. went to Rolling Stone and put it in Rolling Stone magazine. Now, there was an issue there because we were actually supposed to share the title like like as writers in the last minute he took they took my name off it okay really infuriated me they mentioned me in the article like hey this guy sent us the information like like that was okay that's not mm -hmm. okay. no but so but then we ended up optioning the story so when we optioned the story they sold the option for the film rights for the story and i got a, a piece of that like i thought Okay, so this this is a thing like i can mm -hmm. write stories and they'll people will buy them so i started looking into it and doing some research and i realized hey guess what that's a thing like there are guys that write stories and then option the film rights for those stories sometimes they turn into actual movies most of the time they don't there's mm -hmm. probably a thousand options sold for every one movie made in hollywood but you but, get a renewal on the option every few years anyway right they've they've, they've listened three times i keep getting checks from these really people. right I mean, think about it. If you've spent 150 or 200 or 300 thousand dollars on different options, because mm -hmm. you think you can make the movie, do you just at one point say, "Hey, we've got we hired a screenwriter, we hired this, we did this, we we've optioned it three times, we've got 300, 400 thousand dollars into it"? You know what? Ah, forget it and just drop it. No, you keep mm -hmm. trying. So they keep paying the option again. That gives mm -hmm. them another 18 months. Well, so I start optioning stories, right? So I um, and then I start then at some point, then I actually turn that story into a book. Okay. Gen Generation Oxy. And, um, and I got an advance from the, uh, the, the publisher and I actually, you know, they put it in Barnes and Nobles and everything. And so then I started writing, I, I started, wrote another guy's book and then I wrote another guy's book. Uh, and at some point I, I started writing uh, towards the end when I, I realized, Oh God, I'm going to be getting out of here prison here soon. I started lining up guys and just writing synopses, like just a mm -hmm. short version of the story of your story which is basically still more than, more than a screenplay. Mm -hmm. I knew a screen, I knew you could take this story and turn it into a screenplay very easily. You don't need, if you write a book, that's about 10 hours of screen time. So okay. that means they have to scale it down to two hours of screen time. So, that's so you're basically writing treatments, like long treatments. Absolutely. So I started going, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to scale this thing down to the highlights and just write the highlights. And, and that's what I did. So Listen, some of these guys, you read the, the synopses are great, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's it. So I started doing that. And then eventually, you know, I got out of, out of prison. And when I got out of prison, I had written a bunch of stories. So I put up those, those books on Amazon. You know, it's frustrating to deal with publishers, mainstream mm -hmm. publishers. So I just said, I'm just going to put these things, up, slowly put these things up on Amazon. And then I did my website. And then I did the, uh, the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And I've already had a sizzle reel done. A sizzle reel is what they do before they make like a documentary or a movie or something. They do that to get funding. So I've already had a sizzle reel. One of my stories has already had a sizzle reel done. Okay. And it's about to be pitched to a bunch of different production companies. I have another one that's being done. I'm meeting with a guy tomorrow to talk about two more stories, getting those two, getting two story, sizzle reels done. Um, I've talked to a bunch of producers and stuff like that, you know, and, and maybe something happened that maybe. And these are all stories you've, you, you accumulate, you haven't acquired anything new since you've been released. It's just all the stuff you 
acquired while you were locked up with these guys? Um, I actually have about three stories that I started and that I wanted to do something with, but I couldn't because for some one reason or another, the actual subjects of the stories moved to different prisons or are <sighs> or, or in another prison and I couldn't talk to him. Like I'd, I'd heard the guy's story. Like I'm locked up with a guy like his co-defendant. Okay. He tells me the whole story and you're like, this is insane. Or I'm talking to a guy who was friends with this guy for like three or four years and he tells me the story. And I'm like, when I get out, I got to contact that guy. I, I, I got to do the research. Right? Matter of fact, I have one of those stories that I've been trying to order um, the, uh, I've got the docket sheet, but I've been trying to order like transcripts and things on that story. But they like shut down that you can't get it because of COVID. They like shut down the clerk's office in California. Of course, California mm. here, you could probably, yeah. probably still open. They could care less if you get sick. Um, COVID in, in California, they locked up all the doors. Mm. So, but once I get that guy's information, I'm going to write that entire story. I have an outline. It's a pretty amazing story. This is an interesting thing I was thinking about. Um, so you get the first option, right? You're still in prison, which I mean, in and of itself is kind of an amazing thing because you're not supposed to be conducting any business in prison, right? Well, yeah, except for there's the only exception to that rule is uh, writing stories. Oh, okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. I know because I've heard other stories of people like, uh, you know, rappers get their calls taken away or whatever. They took away, um, you remember uh, the guy shot somebody with Puffy in the 90s, Shine? Right, okay. He's, he recorded an entire album over the phone in prison, and right. they took, then, then he was never allowed to make phone calls again. Well, okay, that's different. He's, I mean, yes, because he embarrassed them, but mm. um, as far as, but like they could, like I was going to say, that should, all, all of this falls under um, freedom of speech. Okay. So, you know, it's like they can't stop him. I was going to say, you can't stop him from doing from doing that. You know, I mean, you can't. That's because to me, that falls under freedom of speech. And it's the same thing that that same. Sorry, I don't know if you can still hear me. Same, yeah, yeah, I got you. Same thing uh, that writing stories or books and things. It all falls under I like newspaper articles or anything. It falls under freedom of speech. There's I would just think the negotiating of the contracts would be the issue. Well, you would think that that could be an issue because technically a an inmate cannot sign um, or cannot enter into a contract while incarcerated, supposedly, but that's really more of a BOP rule, the Bureau of Prisons rule, and mm. not really anything that's enforced outside that. Because think about it, if I have a piece of real estate that I want to sell and I'm incarcerated and my wife wants to sell the house and I have to sign it, I have to sign the, the I'm, I'm on title. Can I mm. sign it? No, the warden has to sign up. Stop it. It's not true. You know, okay. there's all these little, if you want to hire an attorney, you have to sign a contract, don't you? Oh, yeah, oh, that's true. That's different because, you know, it's not different. Like, you know what I'm saying? So it's that gray area. Where Which they, you can really manipulate this. Well, not manipulate because the, the system is fucked. Up. And I want to ask you a little bit about that later with the art, with the book you wrote about RDAP, because I'm very curious about some of the good, right? programming with it. Yeah, it's, dude, I mean, whatever. I had my skepticism about 12 uh, step programs already. And then you I read I read this thing where it's just like they're just like. Oh yeah, it's just it's the drug program for prisoners, but they just snitch on. It's just programming them to snitch on each other, and then they told you to stop writing books. Oh yeah, yeah, she yeah, my that uh, made me so angry. It, I, and when she told, when the doctor said that, I always when she was like she, she didn't say stop right. She basically said she said you're wasting your time. You're wasting. So I'm writing stories about other inmates, and I plan on getting out and selling these as options and trying to get them turned into documentaries and films. And the, and she told me I was wasting my time. Like, why? Why would you say that? Like, like you know, I, I think in, in somehow or another, I guess maybe it's like, listen, every every guy in there, you know, every black guy in there wants to get out and be a rapper, mm -hmm. and so they try and dissuade you. They're like, look, it's a tough industry. They, they're trying to make your your goals be more reasonable, like, you know, get a job at FedEx and you can move up and it's a good company and, mm -hmm. and be reasonable. Don't get it. Cause they're afraid that, Hey, you know what he's going to do? He's going to go sell drugs, trying to make this rap thing go. And if it doesn't go, he's going to end up back in prison. So let's try and dissuade people from doing these crazy ideas. But the truth is it's like, at, by the time I'm talking to her and I'm in the drug program, it's like, I've already written multiple books. I have books right now. If you go into Barnes and Nobles, you can get my book. Like I'm not yeah. delusional lady. 
I've already optioned stories. Like, you know, you're saying, Matt, come on. You think you're going to get a movie made? It's like, I just sold an option. They just renewed it. They just sent me another check. This isn't delusion. New Line Cinema didn't option one of my stories because I'm delusional. Mm. So you see what I'm saying? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what can you say? And they, they, they talk to you like you're a dog. And, and you're just like, okay, yeah, I know. I understand. Yeah, I get it. I get it. And you're getting time off your sentence for it, right? So you kind of just go with it. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. your situation was a little bit different. Yeah, the average was, person they would kibosh. Yeah, I'm not getting any time off my sentence. I wasn't getting a time off my sentence because I was never intended. I didn't have enough time to do, get time off. Mm -hmm. I remember I told her, she's like, don't you want the year off? And I said, you know what? Let's just put that on the shelf. Mm -hmm. We both know there's a possibility I'm coming back. <laughs> she yeah. was like, what the fuck? Don't say that. Like, but there's a possibility that anybody's going back. Of course. Of I course. mean, there's a great line in that book that you have where you're just like, look, you would steal bread to feed your kids. We all have a line. Mine's just lower than yours. Yeah, we all have a threshold on, on anybody in the right circumstances will commit a crime. Yeah. I mean, would you steal a loaf of bread to feed your children if you were broke and living in your car? Would you do that? You know, of course you would. Okay. Well, the difference is, yeah, my threshold is just lower than yours. For me, if I'm just, you know, whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm broke. I'm going broke. Mm -hmm. I'm going to commit fraud. Of course, I need the money. My threshold's way lower than yours, granted. But, that, but don't sit there and say, you'll, I would never commit a crime. Well, really? I mean, look, <laughs> if, if you know anything about how the tax code is written, you know you've committed, you, you would know you've committed crimes by accident. Yeah, yeah. My, listen, every, there's a book that's written called A, a Felony a Day. Mm -hmm. The guy talks about how every single day people commit felonies. They have no idea. For, huh. My mom commits them all the time. You know how? Because she takes the medicine that they give her uh, to, that's keeping her alive mm -hmm. because she's old and can't really keep everything straight. She removes the pills and puts them into those little things that mm -hmm. say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. She puts the pills in there together and mixes the pills, takes them out of one receptacle and puts them or, uh, receptacle and puts them into another one that's not labeled correctly. And guess what? You've committed a felony. Mm. Now, do they prosecute people for that? Well, no. Doesn't mean you didn't just commit a felony. Like there's many people commit many felonies every day. Have you ever taken your pills out, your prescription pills, and stuck them in a bag and to go, you know, and fly across the country? You committed a fraud. Or I'm sorry, you just committed a crime, a felony. I mean, there's all kinds of little tiny things that people commit felonies for every day. Just that, yeah, it's, it's the kind of thing where they can't get you. What I actually wanted to, what I was trying to get, we got off track for a second, but so you option the, you option the first thing. You, you, you now, people are starting to know that you're doing this. You wrote your own book. You did uh, Ephraim's book, right? And then more people are starting to come to you. Is there, was there ever a story? Now, as somebody, I've known some criminals in my life and they tend to, uh, Exactly. Really make them, yeah, may really make themselves look a lot like the heroes of all these stories. When, I mean, let's let's you you were selling selling heroin and you pistol whipped the guy. Calm down, buddy. Right, right, <laughs> right. Um, I, I would say, I mean, that the 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 one I'm thinking about is a bailout. There's a guy named uh, Marcus Shrinker. Okay. And uh, Shrinker, actually, it's funny. This is another guy that like people you would people have heard about this guy. Like a lot of people, I'd say. Two out of five people I mentioned it to go, oh, yeah. So 2008, during the financial crisis, Shrinker was being investigated for running a Ponzi scheme. And he was a pilot. So he takes his plane out and he calls in a distress signal and says that his windshield has spider cracked. Mm -hmm. My windshield spider cracking. I'm going down. There's turbulence. I'm going down. Oh. And then he goes and he jumps out of the plane thinking that the plane's going to go out over the bay and it's going to, or, you know, or, I'm sorry, and into the Gulf, run out of gas and crash. Well, when he opens the door to the plane and jumps out, it, the drag causes the plane to burn off more fuel than he had anticipated. So it, it actually runs out of fuel and lands a couple miles inland. Mm. And even though the entire thing is completely trashed, the windshield is not spider cracked. So, you know what I'm saying? You, obviously, you're lying. There was no, the windshield didn't implode. It didn't spider crack. It was in perfect condition, even though the, wind, the wings are ripped off and the tail and everything else, for somehow or another, that fucking that windshield's fine. And the door's open and there's a parachute missing. Hmm. So, you know, he thought he was going to be able to, that they would just think his body got washed away. 
So what happens is uh, they catch them like three days later. Well, that, that, pro, that, um, that story was everywhere. This is a guy who faked his own death mm -hmm. in a plane. I mean, it, that's like insane. Like who, who does that? Well, that story's all over the internet. Like if you punch in his name, it's insane I, it, how much coverage there was. The problem is nobody ever wrote a book about him because they realized, you realize right away when you talk to him, he's a pathological liar. And so he came to me and, was, and got convinced me to write his book. And as I was writing it, I realized, oh, this guy is a pathological liar. He's lying about everything. He was trying to tell me that he hadn't actually done anything wrong other than jumping out of the plane, that it was his wife that, it was that had committed the Ponzi scheme, had stolen the money, and okay. that he only did that to try and protect her, figuring, look, if I jump out of the plane and it can blame everything on me and my wife will be fine. Mm -hmm. Now, that was a lie. That's all a blatant lie. But I, I, as I wrote the book, I realized, that, oh, this is all bullshit. This is a lie. Like I pulled, pulled all of his, all of his discovery. I, I ran out, did a Freedom of Information Act. I got copies of everything, and I, I'm reading his victim statements. Like nobody gave any money to his wife. Like all these things that he's saying, you know, his, all of his victims are like, he said this, he said that, he said that. You know, he he knew, he knew, he knew. It was all him, 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 him. Nobody ever mentions his wife. Not once. But, no, but his wife was di divorced him while he was in prison and he was furious about it. So, hey, guess what? I can blame my wife now. I'll just blame my wife. That uh, way, when he, I get out and I have, I'll have this book that, that completely exonerates me and makes my wife look like a horrible person. And I obviously couldn't do that because when I got into the research, I realized that's not true. But I continued to write the book because I was able to kind of convince him to tell me the truth about what was about the frauds. And you, for anybody listening that doesn't know, like it's you write these books in this way that it's, it's very interesting because you almost wrote like you you write uh, you write them in a way where it's from your perspective talking to these people about their stories. Yeah, I jump would jump back and forth between the interviews periodically and what's happening in the prison. And I do that with Shrinker's book. Like there were so many guys in, in prison that he was lying to. Like he would tell everybody that he used to work for NASA. I mean, the, the, you know, he, he flew more than like 40 sorties in desert storm. It's like, you were never in the air force. What are you talking about? You were never in the military. I mean, you, you, you didn't understand that there would be more drag on the plane when you opened the door, stupid. We all know. <laughs> right. You're an idiot. What are you doing? First of all, and you stole that from the Simpsons. Yeah. He, he, he and from the Simpsons, the Simpsons may have stole it from him. I, I don't there, think so. There's an episode where Krusty the Clown crashes a plane to fake his own death to get away from tax fraud. And it's in like season five. So it's like 25 years ago. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. I'm yeah. Just, you know, sometimes they redo stuff. I was like, they may have taken his and done it. That would be hilarious. I mean, it's kind of funnier if he stole it from the Simpsons. <laughs> if you think about it, like this guy runs this great Ponzi scheme. And then he's just like, where have I seen this before? Krusty the Clown. <laughs> he, um, yeah, listen, it, it's, uh, that would be great. He actually told me, um, well, the, the, he, he had read a book he, uh, called The, um, the Partner with, by John Grisham, and a guy fakes his own death. Oh, okay. That's where he got That's where he got Not even from Machiavelli. Not even from Machiavelli. <laughs> what a fucking finance bro to his fucking bones. He's just a thief. Like, is, like, is anything you came up with original? Um. But yeah, he, so I wrote his book and I convinced him to kind of like multiple times, I kind of con him into telling me what really happened. Like, what'd you really do in this situation? What'd you really do? And so he got to the point where we got to the point where he kind of felt like we were kindred spirits because I'm, I'm basically working him the whole time, mm -hmm. you know? And he would start to, he would tell me, I, I'd be like, oh man, I remember one time I did this and this. And he'd be like, that's nothing, bro. One time. And then he'd tell me something and I'd be like, oh, is that when you did this and this on this guy? And he'd be like, oh, yeah, 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 that is. That. So that's what really happened. Well, yeah, no, I mean, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I, mean, don't, 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 I kept telling him, bro, don't worry. It's in my best interest to make you look good. It's my best interest to make you look. Now, when he finally got the manuscript and read the manuscript, he was livid. Yeah, but at that point, you're out of jail. Who gives a shit? <laughs> No, no, I was still in jail. Oh, really? So yeah. you had to deal with him after he read it. Huh? You had to deal with him for a while after he's read this. 1,800 guys in that prison. He lives in a different unit, and I don't care if I have to deal with him or not. Listen, I, I used to eat deal with a serial killer. Okay? I mean, I used to eat lunch with a serial killer, okay? I, I could care less. I, I, could have, I could have lunch with 
Adolf Hitler, Stalin, and Idi Amin. And I'd just be like, so wait, wait so you do, you have kids? I was, so you, you, you're, you got your date in this chick, Eva Braun, right? What's up with that, man? I, mean, I got I, punched up last King of Scotland a little bit better. Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> like, I mean, I, I would have no problem with that. You, you're not chopping my head off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, so it's like, I, so if I had to deal with him, I mean, what, what, I don't care. He's not, he's not violent. He's not going to hurt me. He's not going to say Yeah, that's true. Anything. You know, we're all white collar in a low, we're in a low security prison and a bunch of, well, not a bunch of white collar guys, but there are a bunch of white guys, but these are nonviolent inmates. And who cares? Everybody, by this point, everybody knows he's a pathological liar. Nobody believes mm-hmm. anything he says. So, oh, so you've got, yeah, yeah. You've got friends. He's got no friends. Cause he's an asshole. Yeah, exactly. So, and he read that book. He just went nuts. I mean, just. This is well, what about you? Didn't even put my you didn't mention the, the thing with my ex. Well, I actually did mention the ex wife. I mentioned that he wanted me to write this. That's and great. So, so he's like, What the fuck's going on? You know, I'm like, well, that, But that's what happened. Remember, we had the discussion about you being completely honest. Mm. Well, and that I was going to look into these things and do the, you know, he's like, I'm like, I did. This is what happened. This is what came out. It turns out, um, you're yeah. fucked up, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I got this. Is I just put in what I found, like everything. This isn't true. That's not true. And I'd be like, but f- tell me something that's not true. Let's point it out. Find it. Find it. Tell, tell me. Show me. Fuck you. <laughs> Walk away. And they just, yeah, that's fucking great, dude. I like, I love it. It's like, there's, uh, so wait, there was a point. So there's a point in, um, so like I said in the beginning of the interview, you basically just stole from banks and I, I really don't have a moral issue with but like, there's a point in the uh, in the book that about Frank where you you talk about a guy could have gotten you time off because he was basically is it this is it this guy is it the same guy from the Ponzi no, scheme book? No, because no. no, you talk about a guy who was basically feeding you information about what he had done that was a little standoffish yeah, from other inmates. Yeah, no, that's a different guy. Completely. Oh, really? Was that a guy you didn't even write a book about? No, I didn't write a book about. It. I mean, look, the problem is, is he's complete like it's not a unique enough story. And he was, there's, I mean, he's just, just a thief. That guy was just a vicious, vicious. I can't imagine. I don't know where that book would go. Just basically blatantly lying to people and stealing their money. And you're, uh, uh, you know, you're stealing from, from churches and he's stealing from people's life savings and, yeah, I, I couldn't. There's there's no way to write that story that anybody would want to read it. I mean, he's not a sympathetic victim. He's not. It's not a unique situation. Mm. It's, it's not unique enough. It, it's just it's just a vicious, vicious crime. And there was no. Yeah, if you could somehow, if I could somehow make him a sympathetic person, I couldn't. There's just no way to do it. Mm. It would have been an interesting story, but no, no. I told him actually, you should. He should write his own story. Like you should write your story. You should. <laughs> You should do it. Like, I'm not going to, I can't, I can, I'll, I was like, I'll help you, but I'm not, it's not, I don't see that book selling. I see. Um, well, I don't want to take up uh, too much more of your time because we're about an hour and I know you've got, a, you got to do a talk later today. Um, but I wanted to ask you, cause all right, so this is what you did for a long time. And it, it's, a, it's a theme throughout your books where you're just like, and you even just said it 10 minutes ago where you're like, well, this doesn't go right. I'm going to go commit a fraud. Like, okay. so, and I've, I've known guys who've gotten out of things, and there is this weird, even no matter what field they're in, no matter how successful they get, they kind of still think of themselves in that way. Like I know a guy who owns real estate across the country, uh, is, you know, is well off, has kids and is just like, I still wish I still kind of feel like a bitch that I'm not selling Coke. You know what I mean? Like you got like that, like you, do you ever have those thoughts or like, is there anything where you're like, miss that or do you think of you like more like how do you think of yourself as an author now or do you think of you still still think of yourself as a con man i mean i you know like i every day i think about it every day i think about you know fraud different scams and things like that so i'm, I'm engrossed in that kind of uh that that kind of criminal thinking pattern mm. that i i try and st- i constantly have to stop myself Mm. You know, so it's, it's, it's just like it, it look, th- if things went bad for me, I, I, I probably, I'd not probably, I'd go back to fraud if things went bad for me, 
But right now things are going good. I can pay my bills. I'm happy. I have extra money left over at the end of the month. I've got a girlfriend. I've got friends. I've got, I've got a good life here. Like it's not worth it. Like, like it, it's, it's ever, you ever, let's say you're at a club and there's tons of women that are there and it's mm-hmm. almost, you almost feel like it's like, I almost wish I was pissed off at my girl right now. Mm-hmm. So I could have, I could justify doing something. No, I understand. Yeah, completely. Right. But, but I can't justify it. Like I think about all the, and do I still think of myself as kind of a, a, a kind of a, a shifty guy? I still think of myself like that, even though everybody around me is like, you're not like that. You're not like, they're like the guys, people talk to me. They're like, I can't see you having ever been like that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Are you serious? They're like, they just can't. But isn't the whole thing, I mean, like you've said, you said it in your own books. The whole thing is you have to be, because we've just talked for an hour, right? And I wouldn't be, like, if we had just talked and I didn't know all this about you and we were just having a conversation, shooting the shit in a bar, I wouldn't think that either. But then you, okay, yeah, you have to be that guy in order to do what I did. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you've got to be an antisocial. You have to be a, a, a psychopath to, to do the kinds of things that I did and walk around and, you know, you, commit that kind of fraud and be okay with it. Sleep like a baby at night. I slept great at night. And I was never worried, never that concerned. I was scared walking into banks at certain point. It sometimes, like at the first time I walked into a bank and opened a bank account using a fake driver's license, fake ID, fake everything's fake. Mm-hmm. I got terrified. But you start doing it enough that you're, but listen, by the end, if anything, the banker said anything, I'm ready to argue. I'm not going anywhere. But yeah, there's a great one where you say your girl, your girlfriend's calling you, yeah. you know, like get out. And you're like, fuck that. This is my money. Yeah, I'm, oh, oh yeah, my money. Yeah, yeah. I'm using fuck, fake IDs, fake like everything. It's it's real, but it's not me. I'm, mm. I'm ready to argue. Scott Cugno lives here in Tampa. So I would love to talk to him. I actually knew a guy that knows him, and was telling me. I should try and find him on Facebook. Um, and I was like, I was, keep in mind, I cashed like, I, mean, I probably cashed 40 or $50,000 and no, no, I cashed like $100,000 in his name. So, you know, I'm sure it caused him some problems, but I, lo- I like Scott. Um, this was actually a, the only person's like- I, I like that. Like, that I don't know. I stole this in- information, but it was available. Uh, so yeah, yeah, he was, uh, um, yeah, Scott Cugno, good times. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I argue, I was arguing with the bank manager. Like, I'm, I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving. Oh, I, I've had. I'm, I'm always. I was always ready to argue with somebody. That's. I mean, look, that's great. Towards the end, <laughs> towards the end you know, because now I know. I know everything that you know. There's mm-hmm. no way you're gonna. You might think something's wrong. Like I had a bank manager. The bank manager th- knew something was wrong. No, I'm not leaving. <laughs> that's great. Give me my money. I want the money. I want. I call somebody. Do something. Do what you got to do. I need the money. Mm. I mean, it's insane. I, I, I cash listen, I, I, I broke up a check one time. This is funny. Went into SunTrust Bank. I don't have a bank account there. I go to in there to break up a check, like a hundred thousand dollar check into different types of check, like smaller increment checks. And I give the woman, I say, look, I got a hundred thousand dollar cashier's check. Give it to her written on your bank. Give her a bunch of little tiny like amounts. Like this guy gets 9,000. This guy gets 4,000. This guy gets 7,000. I give it to her and she's like, oh, it's our policy that we don't break up cashier's checks. And I went, why it's it's cash and she's like i know but you don't have a bank account here so we just typically don't do that why don't you just deposit in your bank and i went well first of all because it's cash and i don't have time to do that and you know wait and then that's a whole process so i just go ahead and break it up into and so she goes yeah i'm sorry i can't do that it's our policy i went really and she goes yeah i said okay i said but you have the money right she goes well i mean the cashier's check's good i said okay well i'll take it in cash just cash it and she goes well it's a hundred thousand dollars. And I went, yeah, I'll take it cash. I have my ID, my, my, this, I start giving her all the stuff. She goes, okay, well, we don't have that much cash on hand. You'd have to go to a cash branch. I said, that's fine. She says, that'll take two or three days. I said, that's fine. Call them up and tell them that I'll be there in three days. Go, What's the address? And she goes, oh, you're serious. And I went, she goes, well, you understand? Well, they'll, they'll fill out a, a CTR cash transaction report. And I went, I have no problem with that. And she goes, well, I can call. I said, good, call. Call them and tell them that I want it all in nickels, dimes, and quarters too. And she goes, I know you're joking. I said, I'm not joking. I said, and when they ask you why, 
I want you to tell them because you were unwilling to go ahead and overlook the policy to cut the reissue these checks. I said, cause I'll sit there all day to get my quarters, dimes and nickels. I said, just because you're unwilling to do this. I said, let's go. I'm not joking. So this, this money's good. And she went, do you have the names and uh, amounts that you want? To <laughs> here they are right here. That's fantastic. Dude, 10 minutes later, I walk out. That's fantastic. I mean, <laughs> so yeah, I never tell that story. About it. That's a good one. That's a great fucking story, dude. Like, that's one of those mini stories that I didn't put in the book. Cause it was like, ah, you're just showing off. You're just being an asshole. No, but it kind of just shows like the ease of which you can do these sort of things if you're confident, because that woman is now thinking to herself, well, if he's, she, she didn't really think you were full of shit. And, but then even if she kind of did, she goes, well, he's probably not full of shit. Cause most people that come in here aren't full of shit. And if he does this, somebody's going to yell at me and inconvenience me a little. And she just gave you a thousand dollars to avoid this much inconvenience on her end. And that's kind of, that's fucking great that that's all it takes a hundred thousand dollars it wasn't mine yeah yeah no that's what i mean that's all it fucking takes is just to be like just so you know somebody's gonna go hey that guy was a dick to me and it was your fault and that's all it fucking took to get a hundred grand yeah. oh time. all right one last thing before we go and then uh and it's only because you just mentioned this you said your brain is always thinking of schemes. Now, I'm not going to recommend anybody do any of these things, but since you can't do them, would you share any ideas? Well, I mean, what, what, you mean like a, like a, what, like a scam? Yeah, like a, like a few minutes ago, you go, well, you know, I have to stop myself because my brain is always constantly thinking of scams. And then you also said you can't do them. And I'm not, I'm not saying anybody that's listening to this should do them, but what if they were going to, what would be some of the ideas you have that you can't implement? listen this is what's so funny it's like everybody's always like can you you can't still do this stuff are you kidding me it's easier now than ever do you know you know um those there's those companies that will buy your house at market value right mm -hmm. that you know you see them on the uh the commercials and i always thought my god like now like you now you can go open up a bank account online so you know how hard is it to steal an identity open a bank account online go rent a house, a half a million dollar house or a $300,000 house, go to public records. Like you can do all of it online. Like I don't have to go to the house. I can do the virtual tour. I can call the realtor and say, yeah, I saw the virtual tour. I love the house. Great. Here's my name. They pull your, your thing. They come back. You verify your employment. You send them some money for the down payment. Now I own the house. Please mail me the keys. You mail it to a drop box somewhere. You get, you know, an, an, some abandoned house, you get the keys. Now I get an appraisal done, or I, or I have the I have access to the house, and then you call you call one of these companies, and say, hey, I own this house. You go downtown and you satisfy the loan on the house, mm -hmm. or you transfer the title into the the home the person's name you stole, or you make a fake identity. You can get them online. I mean, how how hard is it to get that and then call these people and schedule a closing and have a closing? Most of the closings are done online. So I can have a closing, then they wire the money to my account. They wire the money to the bank account you just opened online. Like there's these ways to put this huh. stuff together where you don't have to go anywhere. Now it's so like, people don't understand. They're like, well, the whole system there breaks down where it's like, yeah, but you have to own the house free and clear. Right, but I know how to satisfy the loan on a house. Mm. So I can take, if your bank, there's a Bank of America mortgage on a house for 300,000, I can go downtown or even not even downtown. You can file it online. I can satisfy that loan. So now, what do you, what do you mean? Vehicle. So if you own a house, uh, you you buy, buy a house and Bank of America lends you three hundred thousand to buy the house, right? Okay. You put down a little bit of money. So two years from now, let's say for some reason you pay off the house, mm -hmm. or thirty years or twenty years. Well, how does public records know? Public records has your deed, and then they have a mortgage underneath it. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you pay off your mortgage, all the only way public records knows that you paid it off is that Bank of America gets all their money and they do a one page document that says, hey, guess what? This mortgage was paid off on this date and somebody signs it and somebody's notarizes it at the bank and they mail it to public records. Well, nobody at public records calls to say, did you mail this document? So uh -huh. if I manufacture that document, which I've manufactured tons of them, mm -hmm. it's such a joke 
to do. It's so easy to do. I used to sign them with cartoon characters. I used to sign them with the C. Montgomery Burns, which is the name <laughs> of the guy from The Simpsons that owns yeah, the power. Yeah. Right. Whenever they do shows, they always do, you know, The Simpsons. Whatever yeah, they yeah, do. Yeah. So judge didn't, the judge didn't think that was funny at all, by the way. Really? No sense of humor about it. He didn't give you the C. Montgomery Award for the for achievement in the field of excellence. He didn't look at me and go, "I like your style." He didn't do that. Oh man, I would have knocked twenty five. That's why I can't be a judge. I would have knocked twenty years off the sentence right there. Boom. He threw five extra ones on there. Um. So yeah, so I I did that, and then that's how I end up owning these house. Some of these houses, I would own a house worth half a million, well, worth two or three hundred thousand dollars with no mortgage on it because I convinced public records to, to basically say the mortgage is satisfied. So it's like, if you rented a house and did that, I can easily sell that house online and they'll wire me the money. I end up with a bank account with all that money in it. Mm, and then you just transfer it to another account or whatever. Absolutely. Now that I've got it, you could dep- direct deposit it into, shoot, you could do anything, you could buy Bitcoin with it. You could put it on, on green dot cards or, or uh, prepaid visas or whatever you want to do. It's, it's so easy now to pull the money out of the cash. You could buy diamonds. I mean, it's there's true. so you... many ways to bot to to launder money. You know, I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Well, that is a great place to end on because anybody listening uh, has already opened 15 tabs on Google. They might look and let listen. They're going to get caught a few times first. I've been caught. A, got caught a whole bunch of times. That's something you don't want to get caught at. Wait, did you get you got caught before you did the long bid? Yeah, I was already on federal probation. I got caught before. Listen, I've been caught by the banks. Oh, I got caught multiple times. I always talk my way out of it. But mm-hmm. I got caught one time, you know, the federal government, I got three years probation. I was on probation when I stole the 15 million. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's crazy. All right. Well, this has been, a, I mean, would you be willing to do this again at some point if you have free time? Next time a book comes out? Yeah, sure. Awesome. You gotta put, uh, you gotta put my, gotta put my, my book in the, in the description. Yep. You know? I'll put everything in the description links to all the books on Amazon, to the website inside true And the uh, YouTube page is Matthew Cox. Yep. Matthew Cox and, and inside true crime and inside true crime. Okay. So yeah, that'll all be there in the description. I'll do a cold open for this. We'll get it all plugged out and then yeah, hopefully we can talk again. And I probably will text you for uh, Frank Amadeo's phone number. Hey guys, if you enjoyed that clip, make sure you subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get podcasts. And make sure you follow me at Chris from E-K-L-Y-N on Twitter. Also, of course, make sure you support our sponsor. That sponsor is Vinylgraph. With Vinylgraph, you can make custom graffiti pieces that are on vinyl stickers that adhere to your wall. They're reusable. You can take them down, use them again. Vinylgraph.com. It's V-I-N-Y-L-G-R-A-F-F.com. Use the promo code CHRIS1 at checkout, and they're going to give you a sweet 10% discount. That's Vinylgraph.com. Use the promo code CHRIS1 for a discount.